meeting for the uh, for the session five, which is volatile behavior reservoirs and resources on airless bodies. Paul's title title of his talk is effects of small scale surface topography on volatile distributions on airless bodies. So. Okay. Okay. So just to uh, well, and thanks for making it back on time after lunch. I never do that, so <laughs> we don't have that in common. But um, the, um, so this is sort of an advertisement for the other talks in the volatiles session this afternoon, and I'm really excited about this. I think that surprisingly, in the past few years, even after having several different new data sets to look at lunar volatiles. Um, and volatiles on mercury, as well as small bodies, we, we've started to clarify the picture, I think, more than ever. And I think a lot of the different instrument teams and, and uh, different parts of the, of the community have started to really wrap their heads around what, what their data sets are telling them. And, and even more importantly, I think we've started to, started to make comparisons between the different data sets that really hadn't been made up until uh, a year or two ago. And so that's, that's really clarified the picture. So, um, I've kind of divided the talks into two different categories. The behavior in reservoirs concerns the distribution of volatiles, their composition, what we know about them scientifically, and then there's the question of resource potential. And so if you, if you wanted to go access these volatile reservoirs, where would you go? How much would you find when you got there? Um, and is it enough to be useful either as a um, scientific resource or a technical resource? Um, so a lot of exciting talks, and I hope that half of you at least will attend. Um, okay, so my talk is called Small Scale Cold Traps, and um, this is an idea that, um, it's not a new idea, but I, th I think the, the context of the, the new data that we have has really allowed us to explore this idea like never before. So. Um, I wanted to give, give credit to my co-authors, particularly uh, Odette Aronson, my postdoc advisor, and uh, Norbert Schroghofer. Um, okay, so this idea dates back to at least 1968. Um, this is a paper by uh, Buhl et al. And the thing that they pointed out, so they were interested in, in the microwave thermal emission from the moon and the effects of surface roughness. And the thing they pointed out was that because of the lack of an atmosphere on the moon and um, the extremely insulating nature of the surface, you can maintain huge temperature gradients across the surface. So we're just not used to this on Earth, where there are many different effects, including uh, air circulation, to even out thermal gradients. And so um, if you just do this simple calculation and divide the solar flux by the thermal conductivity of the lunar regolith, you can maintain Tem uh, temperature gradients of hundreds of de degrees over millimeters. And it's, that's, again, that's something that we just don't, that doesn't occur on, naturally on Earth. And so you kind of have to redefine temperature in a different way. And wh what do you mean by temperature? And you have to think about scales. Um, and if you were to, you know, for example, take a, a thermometer and just plug it into the ground, uh, the, into the lunar soil, um, the temperature you measure at one location could be vastly different from the temperature you measure just a few millimeters away. Um, and so th this is the idea that we're going to explore in this talk. Um, and so here's just an example for scale. Um, the Apollo rover tracks are 23 cent centimeters across. And so even within one rover track like this, basically every little shadow that you see in that rover track is going to be hundreds of degrees colder than the illuminated parts of it nearby. Um, and so this has very important consequences for trapping volatiles on the moon and other airless bodies. Um, so where does this, why is this important? It's not just important on the moon, but basically any planetary body with a stable low obliquity can have perennially shadowed regions. And the PSRs that we normally think about are those that are mapped at the scales accessible to orbiters, so typically maybe hundreds of meters kind of scales, up to many, many tens or hundreds of kilometers, in some cases, on the moon. Um, so if you just look at the temperatures within these perennial shadows, uh, you can define 
stability criteria for surface water frost and subsurface ice um, or any other volatile besides water that you want to look at. And so for, for water ice, um, we know that, that it's, it's certainly stable at temperatures less than 110 K on billion year time scales. That means that about a meter of, of water ice would sub, sublimate in a billion years at temperatures higher than that. Um, now, if you put a layer of dry regolith on top of the ice, then the, so, uh, the, the water molecules have to make their way through the, the regolith before they can escape. And so that added protection allows you to, to then raise the temperature criterion to 145 Kelvin, so significantly warmer. So therefore, subsurface ice in general is more stable um, than surface water frost. And the, the, the amount of real estate on a body like the moon that's available for uh, trapping subsurface ice may be much greater than this, the surface cold traps that you can see in, in blue on this diviner thermal map. Um, so mercury is a very interesting case where it looks like basically all of the, the cold traps for water ice are full of water ice. Um, and this is not the case on the moon. Uh, we also find interesting uh, volatiles besides water ice that seem to be trapped in areas that are just above the water ice um, sublimation temperature. So there's these, this is the um, messenger laser altimeter uh, reflectance um, in a particular polar region. And, and you can see there's dark deposits in these areas that are um, where you'd expect subsurface water frost and not surface water frost. So this is, this is a, um, a map based on thermal modeling using real topography of mercury. Um, and the blue regions are where water, water frost would be stable at the surface. And the green, I like to show up yellow here, um, these regions would be where water frost is not stable at the surface, but, but is stable in the subsurface. And in those areas, we do see cold trapping of, of volatiles, but, but not water frost. So there seems to be a good correspondence between the theory and reality, at least on mercury. Um, but basically, any other body that has a low obliquity, uh, which is stable, can, can cold trap volatiles. So, you know, Ganymede is one giant cold trap, basically, but there are other volatiles besides water that can be cold trapped there. So here we, we made a simulated map near the north pole of Mercury, uh, of, of Ganymede, excuse me, and you can see the temperatures within a, a uh, hypothetical crater. We actually moved this crater to the pole. It's not really there, but you, if you had a crater at the pole of, of Ganymede, um, you could cold trap all kinds of things from methanol down to ammonia, sulfur dioxide, et cetera. So on many diff different planetary bodies, there, there may be interesting volatiles that tell us about the delivery and retention of, of these different molecules um, in different parts of the solar system. Um, Ceres may also have both subsurface cold traps and surface cold traps. So we all know about the bright spots now. Um, I'm not going to make the claim that that's water ice, uh, although based on Chris Russell's talk earlier in the week, <laughs> I think that was very tantalizing. Um, but the, the obliquity of Ceres has been maintained at three degrees, um, probably for at least a billion years. And so uh, in that case, there's lots of, of permanent shadow um, in the polar regions that could, could trap water frost. So these are just some examples. So I'm going to focus on the moon um, because that's where we have the best data. Um, but this applies to all of those, those bodies that I just mentioned. So um, what you see on the left here is a map of neutron suppression from the LEND instrument on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. But what is shown here is actually a difference from the background. And that's important because the if you add the background back in, that could be consistent with a general poleward increase in the hydrogen abundance that's not, um, that's not shown here. And that's, that's what you see here. So basically, as the spacecraft approached the poles, they didn't see blips for each individual uh, cold trap. There's, there's gen a, a general poleward decrease in the epithermal neutron flux, which is consistent with a, a general poleward increase in the amount of hydrogen in the regolith. And then a kind of smooth version of that is, sh is shown here. So you can see that just generally over the polar regions, there's, there appears to be more hydrogen. This is showing the same thing in a different way. So here's latitude and the uh, neutron count rates. And you can see there's this kink at about uh, 75 degrees latitude where the apparent hydrogen abundance increases, um, which suppresses the neutron flux. 
so there's a few different explanations for this poleward increase. So um, this could be just due to the adsorbed water and hydroxyl on the, the mineral, mineral surfaces. Um, we know um, from several recent studies, mainly from uh, coming out of Georgia Tech, that uh, water is more stable at, at lower temperatures. Um, so maybe what you're seeing is, is, that, is this adsorbed water just increasing in abundance towards the pole, not having really anything to do with, with, um, with permanent shadows and just having more to do with the, the background temperatures. Um, another possibility is I mentioned, you know, subsurface ice is more stable in the high latitudes. So maybe you're seeing the, the increase in um, subsurface ice, again, maybe not having anything to do necessarily with the permanent shadows. And the third possibility that, that I'm going to investigate here is that what you're seeing is actually ice, macroscopic ice particles in unresolved permanent shadows at, this, at scales smaller than what we can see with orbiting spacecraft. So this is the hypothesis that the extreme roughness and insulating properties of, the, of, of airless bodies, especially the moon, um, allow cold traps on th these very small scales. And so a significant fraction of the volatiles that exist in the polar regions of, of these low obliquity bodies exist in these micro cold traps. So this is how this looks. So basically, on a rough surface, the only, only the facets that are exposed to the sun will, will heat up. And those that are in shadow, again, can maintain very low temperatures despite being nearby um, uh, illuminated surfaces. So the, the shadows can be 100 Kelvin, and then nearby you've got a surface that's 400 Kelvin where, where water and other volatiles are not stable. Um, so what we want to know is what's the, what is the minimum length scale? And this gets back to the Boole paper. So um, the minimum length scale over which you can maintain these, this, this thermal isolation. So um, traditionally, the way that we define the, the depth penetration of a thermal wave is through the thermal skin depth. That's just the square root of the thermal diffusivity times the, the time scale or the period of that oscillation at the surface. And so here's two examples um, where you've got, this is a, a lunar diurnal temperature wave propagating into the subsurface. It gets down to several tens of centimeters. And below that depth, basically, you wouldn't even know that there was um, a, a day. Uh, you wouldn't know that the moon was rotating. Um, here's another example for, for say, an asteroid or, or a, a lunar eclipse. Um, and you can see that the thermal wave on a time scale of five hours only penetrates to maybe a few centimeters. Um, this would also be relevant if you had a, a place in high latitudes that's uh, in shadow most of the time but gets brief periods of illumination where you, that thermal wave penetrates less deeply than a, a, the, the lunar diurnal wave. So what is the, that skin depth? So the, the skin depth depends on the, the th mainly the thermal conductivity of the material. And so um, these lines are for different values of the thermal inertia. The value that's relevant in these very uppermost layers of, of regolith is, is this one here, this dashed middle line, which is constrained by the diviner data um, looking at lunar eclipses. Um, and so the thermal skin depth of that upper layer is something uh, on the order of uh, 1 to 10 millimeters. So again, this is consistent with the Boole uh, result. Another way to look at it is, let's say you had an, an illuminated surface um, and then a, a shadow nearby. You can balance the conducted heat along that, that distance um, against the thermal emission on the cold surface. You do that and you get roughly the same, that's what's plotted here, you get roughly the same answer, um, a little bit larger, 1 to 10 centimeters. So we can say that the, the, the length scale, the smallest cold trap that can exist on the moon, is something like a centimeter. Um, we can measure this roughness and um, what we call anisothermality, so differences in, in temperature at the subpixel scale with diviner. We've done this. Um, and we can fit the data from diviner. This is an example at the Apollo, landing, Apollo 11 landing site. You can fit the difference in, in, in temperatures as a function of the solar incidence angle to get a constraint on the surface roughness. And when you do that, we find the surface roughness is between 20 and 30, 30 degrees RMS slope. That's very, very rough. Um, so we can then model temperatures in places that at, at scales smaller than what we're actually measuring. So that's what we've done here. And it turns out that on rough surface, be just because of the long lunar day, um, if you get any sunlight on, on you at all, you're going to get warm. And so um, 
just the just modeling the temperatures on a rough surface without accounting for permanent shadows won't actually get you that much real estate for uh, cold traps. Um, but the other type of, of, of shadow, besides a, a temporary shadow, is a permanent shadow. And we see on the moon, mainly these, these shadows, these permanent shadows occur in, in craters. But again, this is on, on all scales. And the, the, the lunar surface is, is somewhat self-similar in the sense that as you zoom in to smaller and smaller scales, you see very similar patterns because it's, it's more or less saturated with, with, with craters. Um, so we can constrain the, the fraction of the surface in shadow by looking at these high latitudes with um, LROC NAC image, imagery. And so you can just stretch the heck out of the image and see what fraction of the surface is, is in, in shadow at local noon, for example. So we did that. And um, anyway, this is showing that we can, we can match the data with, with models quite well, um, given knowledge of, of the um, RMS surface slope. That's a measure of the surface roughness. Um, so what is the temperature in those permanent shadows? It turns out to depend mostly on the crater depth diameter ratio. And the canonical value that, that most people are familiar with is maybe 1 to 5 or 1 to 6. It turns out that small craters on the, on the moon have, um, are much shallower than, than we had expected. Um, and this is, again, based on LROC data. Um, shallower craters produce colder temperatures. This works in favor of, of cold, uh, micro-cold traps. Um, I just said that. So okay. So this is this is the punchline basically. So what what's the fraction of of the lunar surface that would be covered by these micro cold traps? Um, it's comparable in, in in surface area to the large cold traps. That's the answer. So um, you get a total area of something like ten to the five square kilometers. So this would effectively and and we've used some very conservative assumptions here. So this is sort of a lower limit on on the the micro cold trap area. So you effectively double the amount of surface area at, at the surface where water ice could be stable. Um, and how does that match up with the neutron data? So here's, again, this, this kink in the, in the neutron flux that happens around 75 degrees latitude. And um, you can see that the micro cold traps should kick in around the same latitude. So this is one possible explanation that we think is consistent with the existing data. Um, I'm going to have to skip this, unfortunately. This is just to show that the, um, there's actually quite a, a, a great diversity within the, the PSRs on the moon in terms of their thermal environments. We see evidence for different, potentially different kinds of volatiles being trapped in, in different parts of these, these craters. Um, this is in a, if you're interested in this, this is in a paper that just came out in um, Icarus a few months ago. Oops. OK, so the conclusions. Um, so the smallest cold traps on the moon are, are less than 10 centimeters, um, probably more like a centimeter. Um, and this is the, the amount of shadow that we, we, we find is, in, is consistent with an RMS surface slope or roughness of 20, 20 to 30 degrees at scales less than the diviner footprint of 250 meters. Um, and so the, the distribution of these, these cold traps based on both the data and the model calculations shows that they, they should be prevalent above about 75 degrees latitude and uh, with a comparable surface area to the large PSRs that we've traditionally mapped. Um, and so it, it'll be interesting to look at what this means for the transport and retention of volatiles on the moon and other bodies in the sense that now you've got you know, even places that looked like they were illuminated, they may actually have uh, quite a bit of, of surface area to trap volatiles. And so, um, one potential exploration-oriented point is, is that you, you may not necessarily need to go down into one of these huge uh, PSRs to, to access volatiles of interest for, for um, ISRU or science. So you could land in an area that, that is ostensibly illuminated, but within that area you'd find lots and lots of little cold traps, maybe of the meter scale that you could go and, and excavate. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Really, really cool stuff. We have time for one question, and Jen, it's uh, from you. Yeah. So the temperature in the permanent shadows depends primarily on the solid angle of illuminated surface that you can see when you're standing in that permanent shadow. So if if there's a crater rim that's that's very or a wall that's, that's illuminated that's very close to you, you're going to have a higher temperature than if you're in a 